Well, hello and welcome to our webinar for today, which is Business Valuations Unplugged. I'm Peter Haley and joined by John and Barley. <laughs> Sorry. And that's us. And we do apologise for the, um, the the fancy name. We sort of read it today with the marketing uh, guys coming up with our unplugged name. We're thinking we're a little bit funky, but maybe we're not. So what we're covering today is some issues in IP, intellectual property valuations, valuations for business succession, and income tax valuations. And so Peter and my background, we're both um, are directors in our forensic section. The primary stuff that we do is the business valuation space. Um, and a lot of the um, uh, valuations we are being asked to do are coming into in these three areas. And what we're finding is there's a marked range of um, valuations we're actually seeing coming out. So what we want to talk today about was really just some of the background in relation to those three areas. So IP valuations are reasonably considered to be you know, among the most difficult to undertake. Um, but having said that, I mean, just be aware that intellectual property or intangibles at the moment makes up about 85% of the value on the um, US stock exchange. Now that's up from about 50% from 20 years ago. So, and the five largest capitalized um, stocks in the US, you know, the Apples, Microsoft, Facebook, etc., cetera, um, are all um, IP type stocks. And that's a little bit different. While Australia is trending the same way, our five biggest are the four banks and BHP. So we still haven't still got those massive IP you know, valued stocks in Australia. But having said that, I mean, there are some individual stocks that are obviously um, heavily, their value is heavily reliant on the IP that they have. In relation to um, your assets within a within a uh, an entity or a business, they come in the form of tangible or intangible. Where we're talking today is really that intangible side. Um, with intangible assets, there's two types of intangibles. There's the identifiable intangibles, which are what we commonly know, things like brand names and patents and the like, and we'll go through those shortly. And then there's the balance, which is the unidentifiable uh, component, which is what we normally refer to as goodwill. So we've talked about intellectual property, these sort of things we're, we're talking about. So most of these you'll be well aware of out there. And what we're often now being asked to do is to come up with a value for each of these. Um, and it's a, as Peter said before, it's a, it's a difficult area, largely because of the subjective nature and what's there. And most of it actually stems to what's going to happen into the future. How is this product going to go without having a, a, a relevant track record? And I think that's where the difficulty lies. As John said, you haven't got a track record for a lot of these valuations. And even where you have, um, you can have a business like Amazon. You now it's been around for 20 something years and it's only in the last two years it started to make any sort of consistent profit. It's been always promising. Having said that, yeah, it's one of the, those five biggest cap companies in the United States, even though it's, you know, rarely makes a profit. People are still buying it on the, on the promise of what's to come. And uh, I think we're really still waiting for it to some extent. Also interesting from a minority interest viewpoint, it's got value to actually acquire it or prices to acquire it. Um, but the last 20 years, people haven't received a return. So from a minority interest viewpoint, what have you got? You've got them some something on a piece of paper you paid money for and getting absolutely no return from it. And as I understand it, even for the next couple of years, there is still no forecast return. Uh, that's return by way of dividend. I mean, you, you can get a return if you want to sell your shares, I suppose, because the, the price keeps going up. But um, in some ways, it's a little, yeah, you know, it's, it's a completely different mindset to the normal way of valuing, which we'll explain in a second. So, to actually value uh, in intellectual property (IP), there's four things that you need to have. The IP needs to be separately identifiable to the remainder of the assets of the the, the business. It must be protected or able to be protected. Can it be identified and patents and the like being put in place? Are you able to transfer it? Is it something you can actually control sufficiently to be able to transfer? And we're looking at something that actually has a benefit into the future, not a benefit necessarily just for today. So these are four elements you need to be able to address IP. These really fall into three camps. You've got the cost of replacement. So what cost did you 
uh, incurred to develop to this point, or for someone external, what would it cost them to replace what you've achieved to date? You've got, I'll, I'll jump to the end, comparable transactions. So comparable transactions are, is there something, is the transaction tapped in the marketplace that is similar to what you've got now? So you've got a piece of IP, you've identified a piece of IP, a very similar IP, but obviously different, has sold on the marketplace for X, therefore I believe I should get something similar. And then the last area is the earnings-based methodologies, which is really where we come into play. Um, under those earnings-based methodologies, there's a multitude of different um, uh, variations of the methodologies you can adopt. Um, we've got here, I think, four of them. They're probably, well, from our point of view, probably would be the main ones we see uh, out there being used and the main ones we're using. They're all stemming around and trying to actually work out what's the additional return that's being achieved from that IP being, um, holding that IP. So if you've got a piece of core technology, how much are you actually able to achieve into the future as a result of that core technology? If you've got a license, what does that mean for your business? If you've got a piece of um, IP that actually really is the business, what are the profits gonna stem around this business into the future once you commercialize that IP? So it's all in relation to the actual profitability that's there. And, and when you do the royalty ones, that's sometimes where you do have to, you know, there's databases out there of, of comparable transactions as to what, you know, a royalty to, for a piece of software is typically 7%, for example. So that's just um, off the cuff. But um, so in terms of trying to 7% of the sales that you could make of it. So if you own the IP, you'll get 7% of all sales going forward, for example. Uh, and that's typically what's paid in the industry. Um, as John said, capitalization of profits just looks at the business as a whole, what your profits are, and the excess additional profits, you're really trying to say, as a result of having this IP, I will make more profit than I would have otherwise done. How much is that profit? And then what's that worth into the future? A couple of questions that we've, we're, we're posing, Sarah, and this is really with some of the issues that we come up with regularly. Um, if we're looking at the cost approach, what were the costs to develop um, the uh, intellectual property to this point in time? And normally this approach is where you actually haven't been able to commercialise or complete the actual development. So you're usually still in that development stage. What were the costs to develop? And secondly, what were those costs reasonable? So for instance, it cost me a million dollars to actually develop this thing, but initially when I actually designed it, I thought it would be $100,000. But then we got to $100,000 to realise we needed to do this, and then we looked at doing that, and then we need to get some more equipment, and then we need to look at that. Um, because of these jumping from pillar to post, um, we incurred additional costs. Maybe it was because we couldn't actually afford to do it all at once, so we took longer, but it cost more. If I was to develop it again, how would I do it? Would it be the same basis? Would I insert, incur the same cost? So those sort of considerations need to be considered. How identifiable is the IP? Have you got something that's, that's separately identifiable? Is the IP developed to the extent that it actually is autonomous and standalone? And the um, software usually is the, the classic example here um, in that we've developed something that we use in, in the products that we sell but it needs us to continue to run it and to iron out the bugs and to adapt it to the new person. It's not autonomous in its own right. Have you got something there to sell? This is where we get into um, the subjectivity associated with IP. What are the cash flows associated with the IP um, distinct from the actual core business that's underlying the business uh, that, that's there? So can we actually separate these cash flows? And more to the point, any sort of um, investment is really its present value as future cash flows. What are the future cash flows? So we're at the point where we've developed this intellectual property, but we haven't actually commercialized it yet. So we're sitting there saying, it's got value into the future. It's got, we, we know it's gonna do well. We just don't know how well, we don't know who the client's going to be. We don't know where we're going to market it. We don't really know what the costs are around this, um, this developing this IP or commercializing this IP. And as a result, what cash flows are we coming up with and how reliable are those and what's the risk around those cash flows you're identifying? It's highly subjective. And, and often, the, I mean, the first line on the cash flow is what's the expected future sales? If you've got a brand new product, 
you don't even know what the market is. So it's it's a bit of a guessing game in terms of, you know, you think, well, you know, maybe I'll sell a thousand of these in the next year. But yeah, if they suddenly become flavor of the month and everyone wants one, maybe that number should be a hundred thousand. Um, there is no market at the moment. It's not as if you're saying, we estimate we will generate 5% of the market because no one else has got anything like this at the moment. And that's just the difficulty in sort of valuing a new product. If you're uh, looking at the royalties, so you're actually identifying the um, uh, a royalty-based methodology to value it, what royalties should be actually levied on um, this type of IP? Particularly if that IP hasn't been released to the market yet and you have no history at all. Should it be 2%? 10% of sales, um, what's appropriate? Should it be three, five percent? Um, if you use two to four, you're doubling the valuation. Um, so from that point of view, again, highly subjective um, and has largely sort of highlights the issue that quite often IPs really got a specific worth to a specific person um, or, or entity. Um, and it may be different values to different people. Uh, I've already dealt with this one. Yeah, is there even a market? So you, you do these wonderful cash flows, assuming you're going to make all these sales, but yeah, are you even going to make a sale, let alone worrying about what the costs are? We had um, a, just a quick example we did a couple of weeks ago with, um, and it sort of fits into a few of these. We had a um, someone who developed a business around selling a product, and it was an online product where you actually joined a club and every month you actually got, got a product. They actually developed it well. Over the last two years, they've gone from a standing start to um, almost, I think it's something like 10,000 odd clients. Um, Who each pay $20 a month to get this product delivered each month, a new one of them. And and it's gone well, it's highly profitable. We've done the valuation of the consolidated um, group or the, the products and business, the like, and it comes in at about a intangible asset, somewhere in the order of $2 million. Now that intangible asset, there's no doubt there's goodwill. There's also value around the actual um, uh, the website, the, uh, the client base, the client list, all of this is actually going into that business value. Um, we also have a recognisable name and made significant inroads into uh, social media and um, doing marketing there. Now, the business is held by one entity, the trademarks by another entity, and there's various names they've actually adopted in another entity again. Domain names and, and brand names and things like and, that. And taglines underneath. Um, now, with those, we've been asked for a tax valuation. All of this is being moved around into a new structure. So we need to allocate value, the intangible asset, between the different entities so it can be a tax transfer. How do we do that? And as it turns out, none of these valuation methodologies were specifically on point or could actually be measured to the extent that um, we can actually identify this one's worth this and this one's worth that. Um, so again, it's using a sort of commercial hat highly subjective, but coming up with a rational way, a commercial way to actually start doing the allocations. Okay, so now some issues about valuations for business succession. And so this is generally for entering or existing shareholders. So should the approach be different when you're valuing for, for this sort of thing where you've got um, existing owners selling or buying part interests compared to um, valuing the, uh, the thing as a whole. So short answer is yes, you still apply the same methodologies, but often you need to consider a different approach. And I'll just explain what we mean by that. So when you look at any sort of business succession, I think first step is to define the purpose. Understand the background and special considerations. So, you know, is there the person buying in might have worked there for the last 20 years and you feel you owe them something as a result of them, you know, maybe having contributed a lot to what is, you know, the value of the business today. Sure, they've been paid a salary over all those years, but without them there, would the business be what it is today? And the other part with that one may be that a certain amount of the goodwill or a certain amount of the actual contact with the client base is with that person. And it may be a commercial approach. You may be saying, look, we'll give you a discount on the way in because uh, it's recognising um, the services you've provided to us. Alternatively, you may be looking at, we'll give you a discount on the way in because if you walk, so will that client base. Yeah, so we want to make sure you hang around. So the best way of making you hang around is to give you a bit of ownership and we'll do you a good deal compared to what we think it's really worth. If we sold the whole thing, 
um, yeah, maybe it's talking about 25% of this employee. So 25% of the whole, yeah, but we'll give it to you for what um, is effectively uh, 20% or 15% or, or whatever. Now with that last point there, will the business infrastructure differ post sale? Um, now what we're getting at there is that um, if you've got a founder of this business, been there 20 years and the existing shareholders are going to buy out the, the founding person. And when that person leaves, um, with that person leaves the person's potentially contact base, relationship with clients, um, knowledge um, and capacity. So is the business going to be the same business afterwards? So valuing the actual on, on um, valuing the business on the existing cash flows that are there, um, are those cash flows that are going to be afterwards? Should they be adjusted? Should something else be considered? Should, do we need to employ more people? Do we need to actually have a tail on this person? So there's things to consider in the valuation that are outside the normal valuation approach. The first thing to consider is, you know, what is the price for the transaction? So that generally dominates the focus or, you know, what am I going to pay? But it should really only be part of the process. We'll probably go as far as saying, normally in these succession planning um, valuations that we do, when we get in there, we find that probably upwards towards 85, 90% of the discussion is around, is the price too high or too low? And the negotiation is all around the price. Whereas it's really as, as professional advisors, I believe what we need to do, we believe what we need to do is actually change that focus. Price is important, no doubt. We need to actually have a commercial approach and we need to take greed off the table. But where the um, focus should really be is actually on the business itself. Where is the business today? Educating people on what is the business? How do we get here? What makes it tick? And how do we move that forward? And, and I'm often quite surprised with people who have worked in a business for quite some time might understand the operations, but have absolutely no understanding of the financial aspect of it and how it's you know, been funded historically, the sort of trading terms we do, how there's often cash flow difficulties. And as I say, you know, everyone's concentrating on the price, but maybe the person buying in may to be, needs to be aware that, you know, well, you only get a dividend once a year after our, you know, best, you know, we typically have three good months of trading. The rest of the year, we're always scrambling to find the cash. If, if the person buying in isn't aware of all those sort of issues, um, yeah, they might just walk in and expect, so the return is going to be, uh, you say, you should get an extra $50,000 a year return out of investing in this. So they'll expect you know, roughly $4,000 a month to come into their pocket. Well, if that's not going to happen, but they'll get, you know, in April, they'll get $40,000 and in June they get 10 and then nothing the rest of the year, they might be in for a bit of a shock. And that's just the sort of things that you, know, you need to discuss as well as just the price. So what drives the value? These are the sort of things you should be talking to both. And even the seller doesn't necessarily understand some of these things we find in, in practice. We, we find that this is really that a perfect opportunity for everyone to stop. The person buying in, odds on, has had no exposure in relation to the financial numbers of the business. And as I was seen, as Peter said, as I was seen, is aware of how the operations work does not necessarily um, join the actual ownership group on the same page when it comes to actually moving forward. So this is just a great time for stepping back and saying, right, for instance, the first one, what makes value tick? What actually works on the value? Um, and, and it often surprises me when we actually sit down and say, right, well, you've got to actually concentrate on increasing your profit, decrease your risk. Those things will increase your, your value. Well, how do we do that? That's a great idea. You know, isn't, it, isn't it logical, isn't it? Not? And they just don't lend their minds to that in a lot of cases. Um, and it's just a real opportunity for us. So you've got there, yeah, what drives value, profit, cash flow, the risk, as John said, and, and the working capital. So um, we won't go that great detail. That's another whole session on, on valuations in general. So business planning, um, other considerations of the financial forecasts and cash flow budgets, if there are any. And, and again, this is making sure that someone's coming on board. Is everyone on the same page moving forward? You know, we've got, if you've, with the tr traditional succession, we might have the, someone who's 55 or 60 selling out. We've got a series of people in there sort of between 45 and 55, and someone buying in who's 35. That person buying in is there for the next 20 years. 
the people that are remaining may be there for the next one or 10 years, um, and then someone's actually selling out. People are going to have different goals, different plans, and different motivations in, in business decisions. This is that one time to say, let's start that process. Are we all on the same page? Let's talk about that now. Let's do a business plan. Let's do up your forecasting and budgets. Where do we want to be and how are we going to get there? And who's going to be here in five years' time and who's not and how is that going to affect the business? All those sort of things. Um, yeah, dividend policy. How much are we, you know, as, a, as a rule of thumb, going to take out of this business or aim to take out of this business? Um, do we need a shareholders agreement or just a memorandum of understanding? Do we need to you know, document everything to the nth degree or is it all going to be done on a handshake? Um, role definition. So, you know, as a result of person stepping up into ownership, is their, their role in the business going to change? Will they take on the role of, you know, something that previously the seller used to do or will there be a general changing of, of roles around the management group? There's a couple more considerations that may or may not come up. Minority interest considerations. Someone's buying into a 10 or a 15% interest, they've got a minority interest. They don't have a level of control um, and they've also got liquidity. It's how, how easy is it going to be to actually sell out? Should a discount be applied or not? Um, from professional practices, from businesses, it's probably more often we see not. In theory, should it apply? Absolutely. In practice, does it apply? Not that often. Um, but it's something that should be at least discussed and an agreement put in place. And at the end of the day, you've just got to come back to a reasonableness. You know, you can you can do a theoretical valuation, but often I think where John and I both come to with this is the person buying in says, "I'm buying. I'm yeah. You, know, you want me to pay X dollars, for which I can expect a return of Y. Am I comfortable with that? And that's what it'll really come down to for the purchaser. And the last one, just that delivery forum. How should, as accountants um, and lawyers, how should the actual information being delivered. Quite often it's it's historically, I guess, has been quite a formal process. You know, it might be in a report, it might be in a um, a documented approach. What we find is that quite often there's, you know, with our clients, they don't want to make it look like they don't know the answers to these things or don't understand things. Is there a better forum? Should it be a round table discussion? Should we have a series of meetings as opposed to documenting um, everything in a nice pretty format before we do something? And um, is there a better format that's going to actually impart more knowledge uh, into our clients? And in terms of doing the valuation, it often is very helpful to us as the valuer to have discussions with all the parties involved in running the business and getting different viewpoints. Because if we only talk to the vendor, for example, in doing the valuation, they'll give us the, you know, where they see the business going. The person buying in might say, well, no, I'm planning to completely change the thing. So. Are we valuing what's there or are we going to value what it's going to become in the future? And our third topic today is income tax valuations and just a few issues, uh, you know, and, and nuances with them compared to other types of valuations for different other sorts of purposes. So is there anything special to consider? Um, the ATO have list, um, issued guidelines on this. And, and the bottom line is, are market valua valuations done differently for the tax office purposes? Really, no. Are they done differently for succession planning or IP? Really, no. It's all about the, the traditional approaches we adopt. It's just, what are we actually looking for? What's, what's distinct or should be noted in relation to a specific purpose? And that's where we're coming out with these tax office valuations. So what we're talking about here is, that, you know, if you've got transactions between related parties or, or the such, yeah, the, the, you'll require a valuation on file to justify the price at which the transaction took place. And that's, as John said, that IP valuation um, we did a couple of weeks ago. That was the purpose of that, to say, well, yeah, why did you transfer the trademark at X value? Uh, well, you need a valuation to justify that. And the thing about tax office valuations is I think historically um, we've looked at those today and we do a restructure, we put it in the bottom drawer where the experts no one's going to question us. Well, what we're actually finding out there, the tax office is actually stepping up and, and testing it. It's still doing random samples, but we've actually seen, um, we've seen one of ours. We did a valuation or, um, for a, a restructure. Um, it was quite a big one. It came in at about 10 grand. 
um, the tax office then turn around and spend about 30 commissioning an external person to review our valuation. And it was interesting, the results of that, um, although ultimately it was all settled and put to bed, um, and it was fine, initially the actual um, response from the uh, accountants that were engaged by the tax office was that we agree on methodology, but we think sales should be a little bit higher, and we think the margin should be a little bit higher. All within a range, and all within the range we talked about, but they tweaked everything to a little bit higher. The result was our valuation came in at about three million, their valuation came in at about four million. And the reality was, it was all within the, in, in a commercial range. However, we had reasons to do what we had done. Um, and as a result, we went back and forth and, and ultimately it was, um, they backed down. Um, but they weren't wrong, nor were we. Um, the tax office is looking at the valuations that are coming through. And, and we had a joint conference with the, the, you know, the tax office valuer, and that was basically the conclusion of the joint conference. We both agreed that we were both within the range um, and the ATO, obviously, you know, their valuer didn't say we were wrong. They said we were within the range and we said the same thing about them. So at the end of the day, the ATO allowed our value to stand because you know, it wasn't blatantly wrong. And that's where, where we actually got up on this valuation it was not proving the other person's wrong, it was proving that we'd actually followed the valuation, um, uh, the normal valuation disciplines you need to adopt, which is some of the stuff we're just going through here. And the assumptions we made were reasonable, and you know, we're not, yeah, you know, ridiculous. If you look through these guidelines that the tax office has put out, you'll see that there's nothing startling in there. There's a lot of stuff, but there's nothing startling. For instance, they define market value in the same way that we all define market value. So it's the price negotiated and un, um, in a knowledgeable, uh, willing, but not anxious buyer and seller um, acting at arm's length. Um, it's the same concepts that are coming through. Um, so, but it does actually raise, we have to fall into normal approaches. If we're outside of that, the tax office may look at that. Any valuation you do, you know, probably 98% of the time, you're going to define it as market value as the standard of value. So this is not anything unusual. Um, the guidelines mention, you know, that market value is different from price and cost, and then defines price, defines cost. Um, Go on to say, yeah, you just adopt normal valuation approaches. So just with that, that, that's a really important point, that just because of the transactions out there, that was price. Market valuation is not um, price, and they make that distinction in the guidelines. Uh, yeah, as I said, the guidelines say normal valuation approaches apply. Um, if there is no market, so there may be a transaction between related parties that in reality, you could never sell on the open market for whatever reason. Um, it might be very specific to a particular person given the staff you have in the business. So the business could never sell um, sell on the open market because it's heavily reliant on its individual staff, but there was a transaction to a related party. So that being the case in a circumstance like that, um, courts have held that you know still you can assume a hypothetical market in, de in defining market value. You can't just say, oh, there is no market, therefore there is no value. It also talks in there, we don't have a point on this, I don't think, um, it actually talks about you're assessing the market value at the highest and best use. Um, so there are a few concepts, there's a fair bit of case law they talk about in these guidelines. So these guidelines are also applicable to property transactions and, and not just business valuations. So, you know, the, the highest and best use is probably something you see more in a property transaction, but the guidelines don't distinguish what, that that's only to be applicable for a property. So I think it's something as a business value you also have to have regard to that, you know, this business is going to be you know, used and run um, efficiently. You can't just assume that it's not going to be run very well. It's not put to its best use. Um, it also mentions that, you know, special value does not equal market value. And what that means is often, you know, there may be transactions out there where people buy businesses because they have particular economies of scale if they bolt it onto their existing business or um, you know, other synergies that may be obtained, better buying power, for example. If, if you own two supermarkets, you can build a much better deal with your um, wholesaler than if you just own one, things like that. And the ATO guidelines agree that that you know, special value doesn't equal market value. 
because there are some industries out there at the moment that um, vets, for example, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a couple of publicly listed companies who are buying up vet practices for what is a higher price based on a multiple of earnings than historically vet practices have really sold for. But they've been in the market for a good five years now and they've almost set um, a new market value by them being you know, the most common purchaser of practices out there. Um, anyone potentially selling to another private vet will say, well, I can go and get you know, five times my earnings from Green Cross, so I'm not going to sell to you for four times. So Green Cross arguably are paying a bit of special value, but the question is, does that then create a new market value or not? Anyway, it's just things to think about. Uh, finally, who may undertake a market valuation? So there's a reason we, you know, they don't narrow it down too much. Just to find it, it should be a member of the recognised body for whatever field it is, whether it's property valuations or, or um, whatever, business valuations. Um, the assessment is to be based on reasonably objective and supportable data. And the valuer should have significant experience in relevant areas. It's interesting what they talk about with the person without formal valuation qualifications, which I think the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia New Zealand, the only ones that actually got a formal valuation qualification or accreditation, but they actually say whose assessment is based on reasonably objective and supportable data. So it's really saying if you follow the right rules, the right approach, you're okay. But it actually does go on later and sort of say business valuers traditionally have significant experience in areas such as financial markets, investment banking, corporate finance, corporate management, academic qualifications, areas such as accounting, finance, and economics. So really, it then turns around and says, fine, you've got some background experience. And that's it. I think that's just acknowledging that historically, business valuers haven't had a, um, a board or, or some sort of um, like property valuers um, who operate in New South Wales or Queensland and uh, I think Western Australia need to get registered with a state board um, or else they can't um, they can't do valuations. Well, there's no such sort of thing for business valuers, or at least there wasn't until recently when Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand introduced a business valuation accreditation, but it doesn't, I don't think the tax office have quite caught up with that yet. So factors that might affect market value, there's quite a few of them, and we just noted there that, you know, if you, if you want to look them up, they're on page 17 of the ATO guidelines. Um, they're, they're by no means, um, Exhaustive, but they're they're important things. It does it states that they're not only factors to consider, but also things need to be included in the report to actually show that you've actually done the the proper consideration. For instance, valuation methodologies, valuation date, the purpose of the valuation, um, the basis or premise of valuation, description of the business, the background. So there's all those types of preliminary things that need to be in the report before you actually launch into to doing it. Yeah. Um, and it's really moving away from um, that. Um, traditional accountants uh, approach where we look at the financials, we'll do a quick work paper up, it's two page and we stick it in the file. And um, what the tax office is saying is that won't cut it. Yeah, you've really got to show you've considered the business in detail and you understand what makes it tick and, and you give some sort of explanation as to why you reach your conclusions, you know, rather than just say, yeah, it's my professional opinion, it's a, it's a three times multiple or something like that. They go further into talking about not only businesses, but also when you're actually looking at um, uh, securities, intellectual property, um, value unlisted shares, hybrid securities, preference shares, um, intangibles, and it just breaks out what sort of intangibles are, um, has definitions and the like in there. There's a whole lot of other stuff that's going into it. So just to sort of tie that into the, the first thing we spoke about today with the IP that, yeah, the, again, the tax office puts their guidelines on, on how to value IP and goodwill, the methodologies and factors much the same sort of stuff that we covered in, in section one of today. And that's about it. So um, if anyone's got any questions, our contact details are there earlier in the slide. So if, um, if anything comes up, you want to know about it. I don't have any questions on the, on the webinar stream, but- You should be able to on your screens now. If you have any um, questions that come to mind, by all means, put those through now. Alternatively, um, again, you've got, uh, you've got uh, email addresses um, when you register for this. Um, by all means, send them through. Uh, or if something pops up next week or next month, yeah, happy, happy to take a, a five-minute phone call just to uh, to maybe discuss, uh, hopefully knock it over quickly it's, if it's something reasonably straightforward. So thanks very much for listening in today, and I hope, um, I hope you've all got something out of that. Um, 
just us sharing um, some of the issues we have with intellectual property, tax office valuations. And I think, um, I think shortly you'll be sent out an evaluation form. One of the things on the evaluation form is um, anything you'd like to hear from a seminar viewpoint, a webinar viewpoint, please um, put those suggestions forward and we can design some webinars around that. And once again, thanks very much for listening in. All the best. Bye.